I like seeing the messages in the chat. Thank you all. All right, I'm going to get started. I'm going to do a little introduction. So give if people join on, they, they don't have to hear me. I just want to say a good afternoon. My name is Judy Margles. I am the director at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. Thanks for much so much for joining us for a conversation with artist Yishai Yusidman and curator Christian Viveros Fane, who, who are going to be talking about Yishai's exhibition, Prussian Blue, currently on view at the museum through November 26th. Included in our mission at the museum, it's a challenge to resist indifference and discrimination and to envision a just and inclusive world. This imperatively drives us to teach our audiences that we have a responsibility to one another and that apathy, passivity, and inaction to injustice can result in public disaster. One of the ways that we fulfill these pursuits is through programs like this that allow us to think deeply about some of the most pressing and interesting issues before us. October and November are bursting with events. I think Amber is going to put um, our website uh, link uh, in the chat and I urge everyone to take a look at to see what programs are upcoming. I also just want to do a shout out for Amber Kirsten, who's the box you can't see. Amber hand handles all of our IT and we're really grateful for that. We are most certainly in a time of chaos. We are all absorbed and heartbroken by the harrowing news from Israel and Gaza. And yet it is a good time to be reminded that art can provide empathy and perspective. I'm thinking of the emergence of artists like Picasso, Duchamp, or Brancusi, who re reacted to the turmoil of pre-First World War Europe and created art that reflected the aspirations of the modern world. Or even looking at artwork created by Jews in ghettos, concentration camps, or in hiding under Nazi rule, which today we can view as documentation, witnessing, and resistance. <laughs> These are artworks that play an important historical role as evidence from the victim's perspective. There was a recent article in the New York Review of Books by Susan Nyman, an American scholar who currently lives in, Ber um, in Berlin. It's called Historical Reckoning Gone Haywire. And it really caught my attention, especially when she writes, and I'm just gonna read you this paragraph because I think it's germane to this conversation. She writes, how do we remember the parts of our history we'd rather forget? Repression and revision are always options. Few will go, go as far as Ron DeSantis, who has recast American slavery as a form of trade school. But those who are honest will note the ways their own narratives evolve. Highlighting successes while consigning failures to oblivion is as common as writing a resume. Nations are hardly less than, le less likely than individuals to embellish their pasts. Historians may toil in the archives seeking something like truth, but public memory is a political project whose relationship to fact is more precarious. So it's really from this place that I wanted to speak to our two guests today and have them reflect about artistic rep representation and in particular, artistic representation of the Holocaust. It's a controversial and difficult subject. And I think it propels us to ask the singular question, can art represent the Holocaust? So this is a question and there are others that we're gonna to explore today. I'm so grateful to Christian, who's the curator for the project and Yishai, the artist for being with us. I'm just gonna do a brief introduction of both. both. Chilean born Christian Viveros Fane has worked as a gallerist, art fair director, art critic and curator since 1994. He has lectured wi widely at institutions such as Yale University, Pratt University and Holland's Garrett Reitfeld Academy. And he has curated exhibitions at leading museums in the US, Europe and Latin America. He currently serves as curator at large at the University of South Florida and contemporary art, the South Florida Contemporary Art Museum. Christian has received a number of awards for his work and he's authored several books, most recently, Social Forms, A History of Political Art. Yishai Yusidman was born in Mexico City. He's currently based in Los Angeles. He explores the history of paint and painting and presents it through a contemporary lens. 
His work has been shown in many solo exhibitions in the US, Mexico, Belgium, and Spain. His paintings have been featured in a number of international group exhibitions, and his work is often included in panoramic exhibitions about Mexican contemporary art. So if you have questions, and we really hope you do, please enter them in the Q&A. Please don't put them in the chat, in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, thank you both for joining us today. I think the first question I'm going to ask, so this exhibition, Prussian Blue, it's part of the citywide arts festival called Converge 45. I want to begin, Christian, by asking you to talk a little bit about Converge. You are the curator for the entire project. Um, I believe the theme of social forms as global citizenship came um, from you, which uh, great theme. So tell us a little bit just overall about Converge and why Yishai's exhibition was one that you wanted to include. Um, well, let's see, Converge 45 uh, or this year's iteration is an all city um, annual, biennial, probably a triennial at this point. Um, because I think we're 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 prepped to to put it on again in in, in three years time. Um, it, it's uh, when I say it's an all city um, exhibition, I mean that it essentially is spread over seventeen plus sites, fifteen of which are important institutions um, in the city of Portland. Um, and this particular show is basically sort of united under a set of themes um, that have as a title social forms, which I essentially nicked from my 2018 book, um, uh, Art as Global Citizenship, that's the tagline. And, and so what we've done throughout the city of Portland um, is put on exhibitions that we find to be specifically relevant to um, that thematic. And, and that thematic again is the idea of art um, uh, being political or having um, uh, a role in social commentary and historical commentary, and and, and also uh, as a as a um, as, as a method to at least think, if not act on, uh, idea of increased citizenship. Right. Um, uh, the 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 quotation of the citation that I um, dust off every now and again to explain that is that. Um, citizenship is the right to have rights. Um, that's the 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 show sort of uh, in, in a in a very broad nutshell. Um, the 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 second part of your question as to why I wanted to to include uh, Prussian Blue um, uh, Yishai's paintings, or at least a very small sampling of his 45 paintings, we have five in the museum, uh, and 30 cyanotypes that he made more recently um, is because one, um, I love working with Yishai. I, I think he's a very important artist. And two, um, because the work essentially does that thing, which at least within the within the club of, of uh, artists and, and, uh, and art theorists and art critics and art historians, Within the trade, if you if you will, um, uh, there have been a number of sort of prohibitions um, set up against right against representations of the Holocaust, and, and it sort of struck me. I mean, I think I, I'm sure Yishai will talk more on this in a minute, but but it, it struck me that if you can't represent, you know, what you know is, is in many ways the ultimate act of barbarism, then then. You know what's the point of the memorializing function of art? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think that that's essentially my answer. So, so for me, you know, um, I, I really did want to take the opportunity to be able to um, show Yishai's work in in, in this setting. Well, thank you, and I think Yishai, you were sort of fed the lines, right, to really think about. From your perspective, what motivated you to create this set of paintings? And let's let's really just think about this question, this this tension between representation, memorialization, and art, and and whether or not art can represent the Holocaust. I'll just I'll start I'll land that question with you. Talk first a little bit about your motivations, and then we'll bring the question back to Christian. 
Uh, well, I actually wanted to take on uh, uh, the question you asked Christian, uh, first of all, because uh, he, he mentioned a little bit uh, the issue of memorializing, right? Um, of course, what, what is a, a set of paintings on the Holocaust doing in an exhibition called Social Forms? Uh, yeah. And here, uh, and at the same time, uh, how does this uh, relate to the question of whether the Holocaust can be represented uh, or not, uh, which is the main question the Prussian Blue Series uh, aims to answer. Uh, so uh, the issue is uh, uh, then double. Uh, and the fit, I think the, the, the answer kind of fits both the uh, issues and both questions. Uh, when we were, uh, and we, we kind of spoke about it yesterday in a chat, uh, uh, we cannot, first of all, we cannot uh, uh, go into this, into this discussion be, before first uh, making a very strong note of where we are standing now at this very specific point in time with a horrible events uh, that happened last week in southern Israel and the ongoing war in Gaza. Um, so we might want to ask uh, as to these specific events in, in, in Israel right now, uh, whether these events could be represented in art. Uh, and who would think about this question to begin with right now at this very moment? And, and who would want to give an answer to it uh, at this very moment? This is not an issue we are gra grappling with. And probably this was not the issue people were grappling with at the, during and at the end of the Holocaust as to whether the Holocaust can be represented in art. Uh, the issue... Uh, uh, came to the fore much later, uh, particularly with a remark by uh, uh, Theodore Adorno, I think it was uh, 1949. 19, uh, it's 1949 and cultural criticism is society. Where he, where he uh, argued that, by the way, they're uh, writing poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. Um, this was within a larger context of a larger argument, but this, uh, this is a, a line that was uh, taken out and, and uh, reverberated deeply in the artistic uh, environment. So in hindsight, in hindsight when, when there's a, 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 a proscription to represent the Holocaust, say, what does art have to do with this? Uh, first of all, what kind of answer do we want? What, what art is supposed to do about it to begin with? So of course, uh, the most obvious question, uh, answer is that uh, representing the Holocaust doesn't mean recreating the Holocaust. It doesn't mean uh, 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 reliving or reproducing the feeling of being in the Holocaust, for sure. First of all, because uh, who, who would want that? And second, because we, art cannot do that. Um, but in time, it becomes evident that uh, uh, art also serves the purpose, as Christian mentioned, of memorializing. In fact, uh, um, very many monuments, and if not most monuments, uh, to historical events that uh, uh, are required to be memorialized are done through a large scale uh, sculpture, from, through artistic monuments. Uh, so how does the Holocaust become memorialized is a question that art has to grapple with. And it's been grappled with, with because there's been monuments to the Holocaust. But painting, paint, the, the issue with painting has, is, is a little different because when we think about it uh, and we look at the history of modern uh, painting after the war, there is very little or none 
painting that was done uh, that deals with the issue of the Holocaust. And maybe this has to do with, with that prohibition uh, that was voiced by Adorno and echoed across the cultural uh, 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 intellectual elites. Uh, but at some point, I think uh, we painters had to come uh, face to face with this issue, uh, especially at a time when uh, survivors are uh, passing and and uh, the only thing we have to uh, uh, serve as witness of the of the genocide of the Holocaust are the uh, sites uh, of concentration and extermination themselves. Uh, how can painting aid in the memorializing, allowing, uh, aiding our memory that this event doesn't uh, dissolve in the past, um, into our memory of the past? But at the same time, it's a challenge for painting uh, because it's also, it's been the last, uh, uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years have been a challenging time for the survival of painting as a relevant discipline as well. Um, I guess uh, tackling this matter, if it can be tackled, at least it can be addressed seriously, uh, had to be done at some point. Um, and I'm not the only painter that's done this in fact the prussian blue series responds to the one of the first and most celebrated attempts uh, for dealing with the holocaust through painting which was done by uh, luke toymans in the late uh, 1980s early 1990s i can talk about it uh, uh, more at length but i think i've spoken uh, for long enough right now <laughs> maybe we can go on to into uh, something else uh, just hey Judy, just to just to sort of clear up. I mean, you know, <clears throat> I, I do want to put it underline. I, I want to underline this Adorno quote that we've sort of trotted out now on on, on two occasions, um, uh, because it, it is a real marker. I think, uh, as Yishai rightly says, for uh, the art elite at least. Um, we were we were speaking previously and noting, for example, that there are plenty of films about the Holocaust and there's plenty of actual sort of like stone and bronze monuments and cement monuments about the Holocaust uh, of varying qualities, but there's not a lot of painting <laughs> specifically, or there's not a lot of work done within the field of what, for lack of a better term, we might call either modernism or contemporary art. And that is a strange thing. But the, 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 the quote from, from Adorno is that um, uh, writing poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. Interestingly enough, it's not that you can't write poetry after Auschwitz. And uh, um, he also, that is Adorno, also actually sort of um, corrected himself uh, sometime, sometime later. And I actually found the quote, perennial suffering has as much right to expression as the tortured have to scream. I, I mean, you know, I, I think that's something that's often forgotten um, not that Adorno is the ultimate marker or whether we do or whether we don't sort of like um, uh, represent the Holocaust in, in painting or any other sort of medium. But but since he is this important marker, um, I think it's important to note that, again, he, he took it back. <laughs> and, and he also didn't say that you couldn't do it. And that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, if you think about it, you know, right up, it, it, it's evolutionary. We had to go from a place of, of literally remembering and absorbing to a place of, okay, what we can do. Um, Adorno wasn't the only one. I think it was the philosopher historian Emil Fackenheim who said the only response to the Holocaust is silence. He also said, we don't want to give um, Hitler a posthumous victory, so we have to keep on living. But um, I want to just explore it a little more with you, Yisha. Why did you why did you create these paintings? I mean, what what were your motivations in tackling this really um, naughty <laughs> n o t t y subject? And and Yishai, and Christian, as a curator, how do you you know 
what are your first responses when you're looking at art about the Holocaust and how do you, you know, how do you respond as a curatorially, professionally? So you should I talk, just dig in a little more to the sort of, I don't know if it's the emotional resonance that you felt that propelled you to do this or? Well, uh, the, in fact, uh, the, the, I, I started working on the uh, Prussian Blue Series in 2010. Okay. And uh, by then I had been uh, exhibiting my work as a painter for 25 years or so, maybe more, 30 years, 25 years. Um, this was the first time that I addressed a subject that is directly uh, Jewish. Uh, the rest, my previous work has had, uh, if there was an ongoing concern throughout my, my development as a painter was to address uh, questions uh, about painting that to me were relevant as a painter, but for some reason had been kind of set aside throughout the history of painting in, in the 20th century. Um, and for instance, my first, uh, my first uh, uh, public uh, series, which was a series of uh, landscape paintings, painted on spheres, uh, they were addressed two issues. One is how can one make a painting of a landscape at this point in time or at that point in time, uh, when uh, also there was kind of like a prohibition to make a painting of a landscape because painting, painting was supposed to address things that are a lot more serious than painting landscapes. Um, um, so, I mean, I can, I can speak at length about this. I don't want to go on about this, but in general, my work has been developed about uh, uh, through answering questions of what's kind of like not right to paint and why maybe we could paint it. Yeah, and that goes from landscapes to clowns to uh, uh, pictures from the news and uh, other things. Um, but in, in, in 2009 or 2010, I actually went to see the exhibition, the, the retrospective of Luke Toymans in the San Francisco Museum of Art, of Modern Art. Uh, um, and uh, there I encountered for the first time uh, in person his, his series of paintings on the Holocaust. Now, he was really the first painter of that generation to make a stand about overcoming the prohibition of representing the Holocaust in pain. Uh, I'm not talking about survivors who of course had been doing that. There were mm, painters uh, who came from the camps who survived the Holocaust and who developed as painters either in the uh, US, uh, Europe or, or Israel. But these painters, uh, some of them were very good painters but they never made a mark, let's say, in the development of, or the, 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 the grand narrative of, of the history of painting after the war. Um, Luke okay. Tuymans became all of a sudden in the early nineties, a very uh, notable uh, and influential painter. And partly because he did these paintings uh, from pictures of the Holocaust which were, as was it, as is his style, very blurry and ambiguous, these paintings. So, so that you cannot really tell what you're looking at unless you read the title of the, of the piece. Um, and those paintings, even though they are powerful and very strange, they kind of triggered me and made me a little angry. But what made me more angry uh, was a comment of the curators of the show who wrote on the wall text uh, something to the effect that Luke Toymans had painted these uh, images of the Holocaust in a very ambiguous way because uh, he's, uh, let's say, supporting the idea that the Holocaust cannot be represented or lies beyond representation. And for me at that point, I said, well, 
you know, then in the Holocaust lies beyond representation, why bother at all? Uh, no, why but, bother painting anything, man? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, ultimately, I mean, uh, uh, there was an argument uh, in early in the 20th century that paint, representational painting uh, uh, are lies, are illusions. Illusions are lies. And therefore, we should stop painting, figurative painting. And that's, in a way, what could say, uh, in some way, that's how uh, abstract art came to the fore to avoid that conundrum. Uh, and in fact, the idea that the abstract art is the more real art or the more important art is because it doesn't lie. It doesn't lie because it's, it doesn't uh, portray or, 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 or causes illusions on the viewer. Um, of yeah. course, uh, if, if, if uh, so as you say, uh, 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 Christian, if the Holocaust can re cannot be represented, nothing can be represented. But absolutely, or nothing, almost nothing should. And, and, yeah. and there's another, and there's another chapter in this sort of like attempt to, um, I don't know, whittle down, blur the representation. And in fact, absolutely, sort of like destroy the representation. Um, uh, and that is Gerhard Richter. Uh, he, I'm trying to remember exactly when. 2014, and I believe they're they belong to the Metropolitan Museum. For anyone who gets to New York and wants to see them, but he did a series um, of paintings, uh, basically with uh, uh, using as source material photographs of uh, Auschwitz Birkenau, and he called them the Birkenau paintings. Um, and he spent about a year essentially um, painting them realistically, uh, and and then had a obviously a complete <laughs> um, about face uh, um, in terms of his uh, intentionality and squeegeed them. Uh, and so all you see is the blur. So what you encounter when you sort of walk into a room and see all four of these large format paintings is nothing but a blur, right? No, there, there, is, there is no realistic depiction of, well, of anything. There is no narrative. Basically the narrative is closed. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that always sort of interests me about Yishai's work, and, and I think we should probably get into this um, uh, soon, is the entry point that he he used to get to the representation um, uh, of um, these death camps, essentially. Um, uh, and that is the color blue, or specifically Prussian blue. But, but before, uh, and I think Yishai is probably best at explaining that, um, but but before, you know, I I I see the floor to have him basically sort of like um, uh, give you that story. Uh, I want to answer Judy's Judy's question. Um, so you know, the reason I I, I actually think that. Um, that things that are hard to represent need representing, basically. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why I think Yishai's um, series, this particular series, which as you heard, he's been working on since 2010, is so is so important. Um, you know, because you know whether it is whether it's global warming, uh, which Richard Moss, by the way, is depicting um, next next almost well, frankly, next door to um, your museum uh, um, at Blue Sky. Um, uh, or it's a, you know, a cannibalistic episode in, in global history, really French history, um, Delacroix's uh, Raft of the Medusa, um, or whether it's the Holocaust, or frankly, you know, the current, um, you know, war in, in uh, Israel and Gaza, you know, these things need representing. Maybe in the case of, in the latter case, uh, the war uh, in Israel and Gaza, they don't need representing right this minute. Um, there is a too soon factor. And the reason I think the too soon factor exists um, is simply because what art does, when it does it well, right, um, and particularly painting, is privilege reflection, right? Um, and problematizing or making, making, uh, seeing, difficult, right? Or sometimes easy, 
Um, but but essentially what it does is it slows down vision, right? What someone like Ishai is doing with this series um, is inviting us to think and think and think again about what we're looking at. Um, so, you know, it, if someone were to ask me, like, can someone make an artwork about uh, what's going on in Israel and Gaza now, I'd say no. You know, uh, and the simple reason for that is that art isn't a snap judgment. Um, it's it's something far different. It needs thought, it needs deliberation, and it needs reflection. And that then needs to adhere, right, um, into a medium in, in, a, in a way that, that carries the story along, but also sort of um, folds itself into, uh, you know, a certain art history, frankly. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's sort of my, my response to your question, Judy. And, and again, I do think at some point we should, we should get Yishai to explain the Prussian blue bit. Yeah. Okay. Before we do that, and then and Yishai, I do want to give you the floor, but I, I want to, I hear you. I don't disagree with you, but is, is it, can we frame it in any way? Is the reason why it is so difficult for art to represent these these major upheavals of our time. Is there some kind of, is it a moral imperative? Is there some kind of moral limit to artistic representation? Is a period of time necessary? Are there boundaries that we have to adhere to that through time sort of fade away? I, I, I actually think none, none of these questions really have a clear, they're all kind of impossible questions because you're an artist, Yishai, you're working from a creative platform. You're not thinking, oh, I shouldn't be doing an exhibition about these death camp photos in this way because, because right? So maybe you shall throw it back to you and, and also but give I, you a chance to- But, but, but um, I, I, I do absolutely think about exactly those questions. Of course okay. I do. Okay. Uh, and and the, the challenge, the challenge of dealing with these difficult subjects uh, yeah, and this is what I think Adorno was, was very well aware of, is that one doesn't want to banalize them. What does it mean to banalize? It means uh, 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 to sentimentalize, to, to uh, uh, spectacularize them, to, you know, uh, these, these are events that need to be considered uh, for their as a moral ethical challenge uh, to the human race um, but we don't want to we don't want to use art to advance say a, a, a political narrative or or a, a Polit politicized program, for instance, or uh, something that becomes propaganda in to serve one one agenda or another. Um, one has to be very careful uh, because, especially the the something like the Holocaust, we want we don't want it to be only a Jewish matter, even though it's very much. Or mostly a Jewish matter, but it's it's a ma Jewish matter that needs to be uh, universalized and understood and appreciated by just about every person in 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 the world for uh, the past 50, 75 years and towards the end uh, of the future. Um, but uh, just to go back to to this question of rather to how how I started to tackle this matter more in practical terms about the Prussian blue. I think it's time to bring it on. Um, as I was saying before, the, the, the exhibition of Luke Toymans was uh, basically the trigger for me to do this. I would have never thought I would end up spending seven years doing uh, paintings uh, based on the Holocaust. Um, but there I was. And uh, I realized at that point when I was at the Toyman show that, well, who else has done paintings of the Holocaust that I could say I would agree with or I would uh, uh, 
sympathize with or or admire, and I couldn't come up with anybody, any 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 others. Um, of course, there are not that there are there is uh, plenty of art about the Holocaust. I'm talking about painting in particular, specific, and and painting has a specific specific uh, 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 challenge. Yeah, because uh, you are limited by paint, what what paint can do, but you by one's abilities as a painter, uh, by scale, by time, uh, and it's, it's not it's not something. I mean, one could conceive of a novel about the Holocaust. There's plenty of novels being that were done about the Holocaust. Uh, there's films because. Film can the scale of filmmaking and production may address that, but painters working in their studio by themselves on their own in uh, uh, with this material that is so limited, paint, pigment. Uh, how do you do that? What 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 do you do? Um, and when when and I said, well, this is this has been a prohibition, just like painting landscapes. It was a much it's a less relevant of a prohibition back then when I was doing landscapes. Uh, but here I found myself in front of a, of a prescription that was important. I said, maybe I, uh, I can give it a try. So I started looking into how, if I was going to do this. And it turns out that I, in the past, I, uh, I had already uh, tried to answer the question of what, how can painting represent something without falling into uh, uh, intrinsic ambiguousness. And one of my answers was, well, let's paint things that were already painted, that exist in the world as already painted. So for instance, when I did my series of landscape paintings, I started by painting kind of real landscapes, but I ended up painting landscapes from other landscape paintings from the history of art. Uh, so I was not painting real landscape. I painting. I was painting other paintings, and then I went on and did a series of clown portraits with the idea that I, making a portrait of a clown, I would be just transposing pigment from the face of the clown to the canvas. So in a way, the the paint the, pa the painting of a clown is more realistic than the painting of a, 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 of somebody. More, not more realistic, but more real, more real than than the painting of uh, where you are trying to translate flesh into pigment. Yeah. Uh, I did a series of paintings of geishas in exclusively white, because way, geishas you paint their faces white in order to seduce their clients. I try to paint paintings using white to seduce my viewers. Right. So, by a strange. I guess, turn of destiny, when I started looking at the, the material about the Holocaust, when I decided, look, okay, let's say, let's see how I would make a painting about the Holocaust. I very quickly came into this, uh, uh, looking online uh, to this piece of information where uh, the Zyklon B, the, the gas that was used to murder in the people in the gas chambers, uh, generated a, a accidental reaction uh, with the iron that contain, that was containing the walls of the gas chambers. And as the cyanide was absorbed by the wall, the iron in the walls reacted with the cyanide to, to create compound into this uh, chemical uh, substance, which is called ferrocyanide. And ferrocyanide happens to be blue, happens so when you go, for instance, to the gas chamber at Majdanek in the in eastern Poland, which is one of the few gas chambers that still stand, there are these blue stains on the walls, very intense, bright blue stain blotches covering the walls. Um, and it turns out again that this was an accidental reaction of the of, of the chemical of the cyclone B with the wall, and but. By a, an even stranger uh, a turn of uh, events backwards, actually, uh, this 
chemical compound, which is called ferrocyanide, is also the compound that, yes. that forms uh, the pigment that was synthesized for the first time in Berlin in the beginning of the 18th century. And it came to be called Prussian blue. And this Prussian blue pigment, Prussian blue paint is a, the blue painting, blue paint, blue color that painters have been using repeatedly uh, since the 18th century. So there for me, when I came across this piece of information, for me, it was evident that as I had been already interested in painting things that exist in paint, in color, in the uh, uh, in pigment, in the real world, and, and using that existence, that fact to transpose it to onto a canvas, for me it was evident that Prussian blue became would become the vehicle for a series of paintings on the Holocaust, and I'd say, uh, you know, uh, eventually I came to re realize that. Uh, this prohibition to represent the Holocaust is 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 no shouldn't exist because the Holocaust itself represented itself on the walls of gas chambers in Prussian blue. Uh, the Prussian blue is the direct, right. unambiguous, uh, historic and factual representation of the gassings. Um, so for me, they, this was a way to generate uh, uh, at least a link, a strong, unambiguous link between the, this series of paintings and the gas chambers. Uh, and uh, the rest is uh, history, as I say. That's just up on view. So I'm, um, I'm curious if the two of you actually See eye to eye, Ishai, given some of the things you just said, which were fantastic. But Christian, how would how do you we we hadn't talked about introducing this, but this idea of art and politics and the tension, whether art is political, whether art is apolitical, should art be political? Ishai, what I'm gathering from what you're saying, you're not seeing Prussian blue as political. Um, uh, I myself, no, I don't have a political agenda. Christian, I'd love to hear what, I mean, clearly there are many even though, art, even though, artists we would say are political. I mean, thinking of Barbara Kruger, I mean, how do we, uh, help me. Uh, excuse me, just to interject, uh, even though I am aware that uh, people, a lot of people will say, or it's commonly argued nowadays that there's no such thing as being non-political being non-political is already a political right stance but anyway aside from that well you know which is something i'd echo and by the way you know you say i agree on on a lot of important things and we disagree on some important things and and that's been the nature of our collaboration now for over a decade um uh with all with all the love and respect in the world but uh, I, you know I, I don't know that reading art as political is a is a recent event. I mean, you know, we 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 can go back to to Goya or, or to, to Orwell, to Orwell's sort of like uh, phrase about all art being propaganda. He actually meant it. Um, uh, you know, there's a there's a propagandist aspect to to work um, with a small p, um, uh, as 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 Orwell saw it. Um, you know, his idea was that all art has, all art is political either by omission or commission. Um, uh, I think the greatest uh, uh, amount of art, sort of historically speaking, or at least in 20th century to um, forward, um, is is so by omission rather than commission. And, but there's a lot of great work um, done that is, uh, the political by commission, which is, you know, tremendously important and that it often tends to memorialize. Um, you know, I'm 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 counting Guernica as as a great work of political art, even though in many ways it is an anti-monument and it doesn't have specific politics that sort of come down to us as viewers if you're sitting 
or rather standing, you know, at the Reina Sophia um, in all of the actual canvas. I mean, it, it, it is now of tertiary concern if, right? Um, but at the time, it was essentially sort of commissioned to represent the Spanish Republic. It was, it was just literally as simple as that. Um, uh, and I'll just know, quickly interrupt oh, I just to say Guernica is, of course, the painting by Picasso, just in case anyone... Yep. Thank you for that. Yep. 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 Um, uh, and 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 please interrupt me where I'm not sort of like giving access uh, because I think that's important in conversations like this. Um, yeah. Look, uh, you know, I clearly my opinion about um, uh, the political ness of art um, is in the show sort of, you know, writ large, right? It, you know, social forms. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, installation or photography um, or the use of new digital uh, means of representation um, or sculpture uh, or painting, you know, uh, can carry sort of historical importance, historical value, uh, political importance and political value. Um, what I wh what I would say, and I think again, echoing Orwell uh, about the nature of art that is political, is that the good stuff <laughs> um, is is uh, is almost by nature stuff that again is reflective, right? Stuff that tends to slow down um, the story it essentially sort of unveils, um, whether that happens in literature or it happens in cinema or, ha or, or in the visual arts. I, again, I, I do want to underscore what I was saying before about painting in particular. Painting is freighted with um, a long history, the longest history of any other medium, uh, the, the longest history of, of, of artistic mediums, period. Uh, and as such, it has to sort of refer back constantly as it basically sort of projects forward. Um, it, it's, it's, all, it's in a bind, you know, that, that's, that's its very nature, which is why it's so important when um, certain, again, advances are made or certain prohibitions are bested. Um, I, you know, I, I've, again, because I've worked with Yushai before and artists like Yushai um, who are stubborn uh, and will not take a prohibition <laughs> lying down. Um, often those kinds of people, those kinds of artists, when they're essentially told that something is beyond the pale, that's the, that's the moment in which they start trying to think circles around the problem and, and hopefully, or certainly in this case, succeed in sort of besting it. Um, you know, that, that's, that's what I'll say there. I don't want to like keep uh, blathering. I, I do want to go to audience questions because we've got a few yep. good ones. Yishai, do you want to respond to anything Kristen said? Um, yeah, just in terms of 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 painting in politics and art, uh, I just want to make a comment about paint. I, 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 I there's it's not that art should not be political. That's not what I think. I think uh, uh, political art just as any other political expression should be judged by its efficacy uh, and not by its stance. Politics, yeah. Not by its stance. Okay. Um, there is, you know, if, if, if we're gonna talk about political art in the 20th century or in the 21st century, especially, or especially in the 21st century, uh, I'd say, okay, probably the most effective form of political art nowadays is filmmaking, for instance, no? Or television uh, as as a way of uh, addressing uh, not only addressing but having an effect on on on, on political questions. Uh, 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 in our in our own uh, present time, the uh, when it comes to painting, for better or worse, and and I think in a way, painting used to be the prominent uh, medium for representing culture visually sure. up until the mid 19th century. Um, and that's why, you know, the history of Western painting at least uh, takes place uh, up until the 19th century in churches, in palaces, in uh, 
uh, depicting uh, royalty or dealing with uh, um, the elites in general, because that's the, the painting had the market of the of painting was in that context. So uh, painting had a, 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 a political weight, you know, so especially when when Velázquez painted Las Meninas, we don't know exactly what political, I mean, Foucault tells us that he was, of, <coughs> you know, that maybe Velázquez was a kind of sort of like a humanist of sorts, but uh, maybe he just wanted to include himself along with the king, you know, we don't know. Uh, but certainly one those paintings have a political uh, uh, import because they are they they were traded in that uh, 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 at that level. Uh, painting nowadays, you know, it's it's relegated to to museums and galleries and 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 rich collectors. Um, and in my view, its political weight is very very limited. Uh, not that it can not have any political effect. But I'd say that it, if I wanted to have a, if my if I do my work to uh, uh, achieve a political purpose, I wouldn't do painting. I would do something else. Oh, so interesting. That, that, that's <laughs> only speaking I, for myself. I know. I really appreciate. It. I think we have to bring you back just to explore that that question, right? Well. Actually, just because I'm looking at the time, we will we'll we'll keep the program going a little past one. If anybody needs to hop off, thanks so much for joining us. But we'll, we'll, there's enough questions that I can see that will probably go to five or ten past one. So here's a really interesting question from someone: Has there been representations through visual art that negate or put a revisionist spin regarding the Holocaust, as we've seen, of course, through writing and rhetoric? Yes, I saw this question, and and um, of course. Uh, the art world, which is uh, sees itself as being on the right side of history, uh, would not uh, purposely uh, um, endorse a revisionist or negationist work on the Holocaust. However, that said, because as as uh, Christian already mentioned, the moment you put a uh, prohibition say you cannot do a negationist work about the Holocaust in the art world, somebody will come and do it. And in fact, I can think of several examples that actually were, uh, in my view, uh, give a platform to negationism or revisionism uh, through art. And this is uh, these works were included uh, to great fanfare in the Jewish Museum exhibition uh, of uh, portraying evil or something like that. I don't Dude, remember. I think I think it was called. I was it's great. You're mentioning. I was going to mention it too. I think it was called Too Jewish, the one with the Lego concentration camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Oh, no it wasn't oh. Too Jewish. It was portraying evil or something. Oh, like sorry. That. Oh, okay. I thought it was too, okay. Yeah, I was going to actually mention, go ahead. I think that's and, a and good the, to And the curator, uh, Klimblatt, I think he's... Norman. Yes. Uh, he, uh, of course, in the spirit of being uh, provocative, included a number of words where that border on the negationism or, or, or negationism or revisionism, and where they were certainly... Uh, Provocative is an understatement. And one of those that was the one you mentioned, the, the Lego set of the of the Auschwitz concentration camp being presented as a, a, a as a possible uh, product uh, idea for, for Lego, no? The, in a way that, you know, in, in in a way that either Lego is is uh, the, the, the Auschwitz, the Lego, the Auschwitz as a Lego set is something to play around with or to indoctrinate children with or 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 just to take lightly as a form of entertainment 
and distraction. Um, I mean, I don't know if that was what was exactly the purpose or the intention of the artist, but at least it's a legitimate uh, reading of it. Uh, it was called. There were, sorts, there were other sorts of uh, uh, words like that, which cost a lot, a lot, a lot of. Uh, oh my gosh, there were protests uh, around the, the, Jewish think, community. the Holocaust survivors, uh, you know, who live around the Jewish Museum, were out there protesting every day. They were. Yeah, it was called. It was called mirroring evil Nazi mirroring imagery. Evil. Yeah, Nazi imagery, recent art. Right. It was yeah. about twenty years ago. Right. Yep. Yep. That's yeah. That's right. Um, and so I wouldn't say that they, they, they were purposely, these works, certainly if, if the curator of the Jewish Museum would say, oh, I want to do a show about negationist uh, contemporary art, <laughs> it wouldn't go past the first uh, 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 revision uh, in the, at the Jewish Museum. But it, it, these works were able to be shown there because precisely because they were thought as being provocative uh, and so the question is, at what point provocation becomes something else, you know? Yeah. Um, but you know what? I'm not sure there were necessarily negationists. And I went to see the show and I don't remember it, to be perfectly frank with you. I mean, what I do remember is the, the controversy. And I do remember the Lego works. I don't remember who they were. So Ishai or Judy, if you remember, let me know. Um, but but rather than negationist, I think there were uh, a word that you used uh, not but ten minutes ago. You sh uh, they were banal. <laughs> there were just a lot of banal work. Um, it wasn't great art. Is yeah, well. I mean, a yeah. lot of it wasn't great art. You know, yeah. a lot of it was sort of like shock art. Um, and again, that's one of the things uh, about I mean, you, you get a lot of you can let a lot of time pass. <laughs> Um, this is not a too soon problem, or it wasn't too soon problem in 2002, which is when I think the show was. Um, it, it was, you know, a, a not enough reflection going on problem, um, or simply, you know, a, a, a banal problem. Um, but there's plenty of negation to start that I can think of on another, you know, very heavy subject um, around which there has been plenty of representation, particularly of late. And that is sort of the issue of slavery in the Confederacy in the American South. Um, uh, and the revisionist or negationist work that, I, that immediately comes to mind are the Confederate statues, right? Uh, many of which were literally sort of like made in the, in the early, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, right? Um, they're not, they, they, they were not, they were not, um, memorials, monuments, statues uh, erected uh, during the, the period of the Confederacy. Um, these are essentially sort of Jim Crow um, monuments, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention yeah, another thing. Go ahead. I, I, I wouldn't say they, they are negationists. They, they're probably, uh, I mean, you could say you may criticize them or condemn them, uh, but then they don't negate the the Civil War, they basically... Uh, but they negate a history of slavery and its aftermath. Uh, no, they mean, they. I don't think they negate the history. They, they, they don't, they're not on the same team, but they're not saying that what the other side is saying are lies. Hmm. Oh, I think they are, but we'll agree yeah, to disagree. But anyway, it, it's yeah. not, I, I don't want to be put in the position of defending. <laughs> of defending <laughs> Confederate statues. Confederate art. Don't you know? want you in Get that. out of the way. Get out of the way. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm going to ask one more question, but um, I, there is an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in Vienna. You might want to just look it up and read about it because it has been wildly controversial. The title is something like 100 Misunderstandings About Jews or About Yes, it has another, I'm missing a phrase in there, but 100 Misunderstandings About Jews. It's been open for a couple of months at the Jewish Museum in Vienna. It's a new director. Their longtime director had departed. And so it's one of her first exhibitions and she has been excoriated for it. So, um, and, and back to this idea of politics, someone is asking, um, isn't the political issue of a painting in the eye of the beholder? As an artist, as a curator, is that where you want these issues to be settled? Or do you want to be more 
proactive about directing how people are going to be, be responding. We'll start with Kristen. No, I don't think you want to be proactive. I mean, I don't think I want to be any, I don't think I want to be any more proactive than providing act, genuinely informative wall text, you know, and a decent press release. The rest of the work is basically sort of done by the audience, the viewer. But that doesn't mean that the viewer does all the work. Um, you know, there is a, a dialogue, at least between the artist and the viewer, clearly, and at some point also between the curator and the artist and the viewer. And frankly, let's not forget the institution. So there's the institution, the artist, the viewer, the curator, right? Um, just to mention some of the people who uh, it, some of the people it takes to put on an exhibition. Um, uh, and there are many more. Um, um, you know, I, I, I think the, the magic or lack thereof um, uh, happens, you know, in that, in that, in that, in that circle, um, uh, you know, and hopefully that circle expands because, you know, you have somebody writing about it. So you have a critic or a journalist um, essentially sort of expanding the, the story uh, out into a wider public. Um, yeah, again, not to repeat myself, but I, but, but I, I do think that that's where the the discourse that begins in the artist studio um, has its sort of like fullest um, receives its fullest voice, um, and and I'm I, I think that's grand. I'm 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 good with it. Thank you. I would say that uh, no painting. And the political issue of a painting is not only on the eye of the beholder, but the eye of the beholder, of the beholder, of course, is needed in order to uh, 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 trigger that political issue. Um, let's just say uh, a, 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 a political reaction or politicized reaction to a painting that happened recently. I can think of the this uh, uh, gigantic banner, mural banner in Documenta uh, mm. last uh, uh, summer. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't go, I didn't see it in person. I just follow the, the, the reaction uh, where, where uh, basically uh, in in my understanding or my appreciation of it, there was a a, a, a very large uh, mural, portable mural that was painted that by some sort of uh, activist artist group back in uh, uh, Indonesia, Indonesia, uh, twenty years ago, and this was uh, the, the, this this mural was. Uh, Say a political mural against the the, the dictatorship of Suarto and the history of uh, the Western powers, uh, supposedly uh, or arguably uh, uh, or definitely, according to the mural, uh, uh, um, laying behind uh, the power of Suarto. Among which there was a uh, depiction of an uh, Israeli soldier standing for a, a symbol of Israel, which had some pretty offensive uh, uh, characteristics, uh, including an SS, uh, SS uh, marking on the, on the, among other things. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it caused an, an enormous uproar, um, especially being shown in Germany of all places. Uh, so here we saw uh, uh, a, a basically anti-Semitic depiction of Israel that had percolated into a left-wing mural in Indonesia 20 years ago and finding its way back to Germany uh, uh, to use where, where, where the, the Nazi iconography was put into a, a play for a, a purpose that was not at all um, 
a, a prettier or thought of when it was done, but but hey, but we're, and we're was, virtually but they, outlawed, and where that imagery is virtually outlawed. Yeah, but this was definitely a political painting that ended up being a polit ended up having a politicized effect that was completely out of the contrary, <laughs> out of the the, the purview of, of the creators, uh, or and, the curators, or the yeah, institutions, or the curators too. Yeah, but certainly the eyes, the idol, the eyes of the beholders were needed in order to bring that forth. Uh, otherwise, this would have been just another kind of like pretty picture there in some art show somewhere. Uh, it wasn't pretty, but but just, you know, another uh, uh, expression of politicized painting that has no minor meaning. I think it created, the, the, this effect actually made us, uh, it became an important famous painting and now this painting has a history and it will be shown who knows where uh, with a long text from the curator to explain what it is and what happened uh, but that 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 is how paintings nowadays can indeed acquire a political uh, a political effect which to my to my I mean I would mind my painting to generate such an effect uh, uh, in, because it wasn't it wasn't a pretty thing uh, but, but there you go there you go but that that's how politics becomes involved with painting these days oh boy i think we could keep talking forever but i think we probably have to close off the conversation um amber actually put in the chat the link to the photographs of Prussian blue. So you can see it, it's, I think it's like the last thing in the chat. So um, you wanna click on that if you wanna see photos of the exhibition for anyone living in Oregon, particularly in Portland, please do stop by and see the show. It runs until November 26th. And we also have another fall exhibition that opened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Leonard Baskin, the great bird man. And I love the combination of Baskin and you said men. I think it's quite, quite beautiful. When I've toured and been able to talk about both exhibits, I, I find that I can make some, some kind of connections between them. I really want to thank both of you. Um, these are not easy issues for us to consider. Uh, Isha, I thank you so much for giving us this work to show and Christian for curating it so beautifully. Any last, you know, just very brief last words you want to end with, and then we'll close out and thank you. I just want to say thank you, Judy and the Oregon Jewish Museum uh, for the opportunity to show this work in, in Portland. Um, and whoever is in this uh, chat and, and hasn't seen the show, I can see the show, please come and see it because ultimately we're talking and talking, but uh, uh, what's important is, yes, to make these paintings have an effect on the eye of the beholder. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's just uh, uh, words on the air. Uh, again, thank you for, for, for having us. Thank you. Christian, anything from you? Yeah, I, I just, uh, I, I want to re basically ditto what, what he said. Um, Thank you uh, very much, Judy, and everyone at the museum. Um, you've been an, an absolute pleasure to work with. And um, viewers, uh, audience, please take uh, Yishai up on his invitation. It's a terrific show. It's a terrific museum. Um, do see it. Do see the exhibitions there. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe. We know we're in a world of trouble right now so just do what you can okay thank you everyone good thank afternoon you. thank you so much christian thank you thank, thank you amber good afternoon everyone